The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. My thoughts give me power. No scholar can map them. No hunter can trap them. No person can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei. No person can deny. Die Gedanken sind frei. Welcome to Free Thought Forum. My name is Don Dinatelli, and with me today is Jeff Levan. And we're going to attempt to define the term atheism and then defend uh, that uh, belief or absence of a belief. In preparing for this program, I uh, just thought I'd look up the word atheism in the thesaurus on my uh, word processor in my home computer. And I found that uh, the, uh, some of the synonyms for atheist were agnostic, gentile, heathen, heretic, immoral, infidel, non-Christian, pagan, and unbeliever. And after looking up some of the uh, more questionable ones, such as pagan and uh, infidel, I actually found myself agreeing with most of them, except for immoral. And I had a real problem with that. The Christians, Jews, and Muslims in particular have incorporated right and wrong into their theology so that to disbelieve in their God is to uh, be by definition immoral or amoral. But Jeff, what about uh, the idea of God in general? I mean... Yeah, well that's one of the things that we're going to discuss here too is that and atheism does not, is not just an anti-Christian stance. It's not just an anti-Jehovah uh, stance. Uh, we tend to think in terms of our narrow perspective of Judeo-Christian that I love that little hyphenated word, you know, Judeo-Christian. But we tend to think in terms of that because that's there's a lot of history in our country of, of that, and the majority of the people have that background and that experience culturally growing up in the United States. However, there are there's one quarter of the population that's Chinese, for instance, that believes in the, the Analects of Confucius or Buddhism, and they have a different uh, belief. Uh, my point being that in discussing atheism, we are taking the word uh, as its root meaning of theism, meaning belief in a, a God, a supernatural being of any description. I don't care if you're, I don't care if you're Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, whatever. Okay, <laughs> atheism is is an opposite viewpoint to all of that, including New Agers, spiritualists. Uh, including Satanists, for that matter. Uh, we're also anti-Satanists, so maybe we can find some common ground there with the Christians. But, but atheism is absence of belief in any of that, in any form of supernatural uh, entity that controls a life, okay. created life, etc. So okay. that definition out of the way. Maybe we can go on to uh, discussing some of the classical uh, proofs or the classical arguments for the existence of a generic god or, or any type of supernatural god. Okay, there, if I'm not mistaken, there are three classical proofs that uh, that are given that name. Major ones. Yeah, yeah. and um, they are uh, the argument from being called scarily enough the ontological argument. Ontology just means having to do with being or essence or whatever those things are. That's one the cosmological argument, which is also known as the argument from first cause, and the teleological argument, which is the argument from design. Okay, And that's probably one of the most powerful arguments used to uh, quote unquote prove the existence of God. But first of all, before we get into those, could you tell me whether or not atheists really have something to prove? I mean, is it up to us to prove that God doesn't exist? Well, it's, a, it's up to us to respond to the proofs that are expounded by people who do believe. However, if you're talking in a, in a purely logical sense, a purely argumentative sense, uh, you cannot prove a negative. In other words, 
if we, in all we've seen, in all that our scientists have seen with, with telescopes and such, and we haven't found heaven or hell anywhere in all of this, or, or God, we haven't found this bearded figure that people used to believe existed just outside of our sight in the heavens. With all the knowledge that we have, there are still people saying, well, we haven't sought far enough. And that argument can be... It means well, that nothing. could be extended forever. You could go forever. No yeah. matter how much we know, okay. people can always say, well, just, just beyond our knowledge, there's something else yeah. that you haven't found yet. Well, all I can say to, to counter that is that they have an assertion that I feel they have to prove. Oh, okay. And, and, and they are proposing that there is a, the Christian religion says there was a creator God who did this, this, and this in Genesis. Did this, this, and this going through the books to Jesus Christ, the whole story, all the way to the last so, page and amen uh, in the Bible. Yeah. Uh, we, we could refute that point by point. Okay. Um, you know, but my basic idea being that I would say any one of these religions can be pretty much, they have if you look outside of just a, just a because the book says so, that's a very weak argument. Because as we all know, there are thousands of religions, and they all have their doctrines. And just saying that because a book says so does not is not proof. It's not a, it's not a valid argument. Uh, so the arguments that you mentioned earlier are the ones that we should be addressing, independent of any book. Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's let's take on the uh, the first uh, argument. And uh, like I said, it's called the argument from being, and it's sim simply stated, it's this. God is perfect. Okay, that's his essence. Okay. Without existence, there would be a flaw in that essence. Since God is perfect, he must therefore exist. What do you think about that? Well, for something to be real, it has to be observable in one way or another. Maybe not by sight, but even the wind, you know, which you say you can't see it, you can feel it. We only know, we can only go with what we know. Yeah. It's well, radio for waves, for instance, aren't directly exist. sensible. But we can, but we can sense but them. But we do have equipment to sense them, and we can uh, obviously... Uh, they exist. Yeah, measure them in all ways, so in that way, they it's, are it's definitely real. demonstrable. They're real. Okay. They're, they're real, even though we may not be able to see, touch. There are thousands of radio and television shortwave ra waves going through us at this moment, mm -hmm. and with every person who's watching uh, the cable program right now. Uh, you don't get all of your stuff from cable. There's still, there's still <laughs> you know, of course, you're getting it from cable there, but there's plenty of stuff that's still going through the years. Uh, the, the point being with that is we've, we've searched and searched and looked and looked, and we have not found any being Okay, so then this this argument from being then is simply a uh, an attempt to say, well, look, you know, God by definition exists. I came across this this poem that I'd like to read real quick uh, that I think is pretty cute that kind of sums up this argument, um, and it's called God. Then let us debate him with zealous persistence, knowing before we be knowing before we begin that I can define them out of existence and you can define them back in. Now, I think that's kind of cute and that kind of sums up the whole uh, idea of the, the existence or the argument from being. Next most serious argument might be the uh, cosmological argument or the argument from first cause. Would you like to summarize that for us? Well, with the, the first cause says that uh, man, of, man I, the basis for this is pretty common sense. You can, you can look back and see how man formulated this argument. He sees animals having animals, knowing that animals come from animals, humans come from humans. A woman has a child, it grows up, becomes man or woman, keep has more keeps going. You know? sure. Knowing that, man began to think backwards. Well, what came before this? And it being very hard to conceive of an idea of infinite, infinite time or space, especially backward in time, man came to the conclusion that there must have been a beginning at some point. And if there was a beginning beyond which nothing else came from, if you take everything back to its original beginning, that therefore there must have been something other than in the real world to create all of this. Of course, the okay. argument has a few flaws in it, which I think you're <laughs> chopping at the bit to get at. Okay, yeah. You know, the, the first thing that hits you right away is, uh, well... Maybe there 
is an infinite regress, okay? Maybe if we go back in time far enough, we find out that uh, life forms, for instance, have changed over time, and maybe life itself evolved from non-living but organic chemicals. Maybe these organic chemicals were forged in the uh, hearts of giant stars, you know, and so on, backward, backward to the moment of the Big Bang. And there are some serious cosmologies, that is, descriptions of the universe as a whole, that say that possibly before the Big Bang was a big crunch. In other words, all of energy and matter came crashing down on itself and then exploded. Well, what was there before it came crashing down? Maybe another Big Bang. So what we see maybe is an infinite regress of Big Bangs and Big Crunches. And in this way, we have what we call an oscillating universe. So that's a possibility. Maybe there is an infinite regress. But even if I grant you the point that, okay, the infinite regress is something we don't like, so we won't have it. Why isn't there a cause for God? The basis of the argument was that uh, everything has a cause. Every effect has a cause. Yeah. You say, well, God is the uncaused cause, or the uncaused effect, or however you want to state it. You shot yourself in the foot. <laughs> That's right. Because you could say, well, the universe is mm -hmm. the uncaused effect. And the universe is, to me, it's, if you want to bet on it, it's better to bet on something that you can actually sense. And observe. And observe and, you know, study, rather than something that, uh, you know, nobody can sense and everyone has a different idea of. So I try, I try to look at it in, in the sense of, you know, the common sense and say, well, you know, when you have a, you have a trial, for instance, you know, when you're judging something, that's what we're doing. We're judging. You know, you can, if you're not going to judge it, if you're not going to play the game, if you're going to say, well, I'll accept this on faith and that's it, then don't come to me and try to say that you have proof or don't try to try to come to me and say that uh, you have a good reason for your belief. If you're just going to believe it for no reason, fine, believe it for no reason. Uh, but I can't, I don't have to accept you as a logical person then <laughs> because, you know, someone who comes with, at me with that it's argument. It's not very convincing, is right. it? Right. And I say, if you have, a, look at it in terms of, a, you're a member of a jury and all of this is being presented to you. Nature presents itself to you. And our best minds, other people on the jury, scientists, whatever, uh, theologians included, come up with these ideas and they test them. They see, does this make sense? Now, if you're in a jury and uh, you're, you're, they bring out evidence. They say, well, you know, I'm going to prove that John killed his uncle, you know. And uh, the defense attorney said, no, he didn't. And then they start proving their cases. Mm -hmm. And you've come to find out that John has a bloody hammer in the back of his trunk that's found. John can't account for where he was at the time. His uncle had a $500,000 life insurance policy with John as the beneficiary that was, that was <laughs> taken out three weeks beforehand. And you, all these things, you begin to get motive and stuff. No one there on the jury was there at the time. No one knows by first-hand knowledge whether or not John actually killed him. But, but the thing is, no. to be useful, for society to be useful, to make a useful judgment at all about John, our analogy here, uh, we have to go by the evidence. And when you get to a certain point, you have to say, if I was a betting man, where would I place my trust? Now, we have on one side all of the scientific knowledge that we've encountered is consistent. It's the, this huge, enormous body of knowledge that we have about the natural world. And on the other side, we have a book or a belief or one little religion that can't stand on anything. It doesn't have anything to back it up. You weigh the scales. Make up your own <laughs> mind. That's, that's my... Uh... Okay. And, and there never really was a case where in the history of science or the development of uh, civilization where a supernatural explanation for something actually uh, uh, took the place of a natural explanation. It's always been the other way around, hasn't it? You know, we've always found natural explanations that if, if they don't outright contradict the supernatural explanations, they at least certainly give you something 
more to put a handle on, something more to study than just saying, well, God put it into existence. Yeah, we don't, we don't go out in the morning and turn our key and expect a, a demon to start our car all of a sudden. <laughs> instead of, you know, we, we, have, we, have, we constantly have faith in the real world. As we go through life, you know, every day, all of us, and the very fact I'm sitting in front of this camera, I believe that it's going on videotape, sure. electromagnetic media. You know, it's a, that's, that's a faith in experience. Right. It's a faith in um, um, things that we know have worked in the past. And I'll tell you, sometimes there are mornings when I go out and get into my car and start it, <laughs> try to start it up, and it doesn't start up, and then I feel a little uncomfortable <laughs> because my confidence has been shaken. Um, but I've got you know, a truck you should need. There's, <laughs> always, there's always some kind of rational explanation. And um, you know, more often than not, it has to do with my inability to keep up a car. But we digress. Let's get to the third argument, which is probably the most impressive argument for God's existence. And that is the teleological argument, or argument from design. One thing that believers, without question, always bring up to me is... How can you believe that there is no God? Look at a leaf. Look at the stars at night. Look at the sunset. Look at our beautiful world and the way it works. It's funny, though, when they start talking about uh, social problems in the world, it all of a sudden turns into an ugly and evil world corrupted by mankind. Yes. But you know, that's another <laughs> subject, I guess. Were you talking about the, wasn't there an analogy made, I believe it was St. Thomas Aquinas, about, about the, uh, the watch? saying that there was a, a Ah, a yes, watch. that's right. If you had found a watch, you, you would not assume that it occurred naturally. You would assume that it, someone had made it. Right. He puts his uh, person on a deserted beach, and he says, okay, you find a watch. What are you going to assume? Well, you're going to assume that this watch is the product of design. You know, how much more wonderful are human beings uh, compared to watches? They're infinitely more wonderful. I mean, you talk about complex moving parts and apparatuses that uh, uh, perform all different sorts of tasks. The human eye alone is a uh, marvelous uh, instrument, uh, unless, of course, like me, you happen to wear glasses, you know, and you don't think it's so marvelous, possibly. Um, but that analogy of St. Thomas Aquinas is faulty for this reason. The reason why we know the watch is designed is not because we know that it has a purpose, not because we know it has an interaction of parts, but it's because our experience with watches tells us that these things are only the product of human beings. There are no natural processes we know of that form watches. Even if I had never seen a watch before, I would probably assume that it was manufactured by someone. On the other hand, if I find a dead fish washed up on the beach, I don't think, aha, this is evidence for somebody who manufactured that fish out in the ocean. No, I know that the fish was probably born. <laughs> it uh, may have been uh, hatched, hatched from an egg or, or whatever. But in this um, context, we're talking about something completely different. Our only experience with human beings and living things is that they come from other living things. And if we go back far enough in time by way of, say, the fossil record, then we find out that a lot of the things that are alive today weren't alive in the past. So this and leads vice us... vice versa. A lot yeah. of things in the past aren't alive today. And a lot, exactly. This leads us to the conclusion that life has changed over time. If we go back very far in the fossil record, we find that there's a point where there aren't any really large life forms running around. It's all microscopic. We go back even further and we find that those things aren't even around. What this t says to me is that there's a progression there, a very natural progression. The only thing that science hasn't quite penetrated with a high degree of confidence is how did life arise from non-living materials. If indeed it did. Yeah. We, we, we don't have that answer, uh, but that's no reason to assume, as our primitive forebearers did, that 
a grand person in the sky. If you look at all the religions, they're very ancient. They come from... The people were ignorant. They didn't know. It's not to their fault. They did the best with what they had. They knew a lot about uh, what they could observe with the natural eye, but they didn't have the tools that we have nowadays to, to probe and to find out more knowledge. And we're seeking these answers still. And I don't think we should rest upon a supernatural belief. Uh, religions will tell you they have the answer to all of this. They know all the answers. Science says, no, we don't have all the answers, may never know all the answers, but we've got to keep looking. We've got to keep searching for those answers. Okay. That, you know, that indicates... Another, I was, I'm, I'm sorry. I was going to say one other thing about the, the teleological argument. Uh, it also gets back to the same old question of, well, then who made God? If God is such a fantastic <laughs> organized... You know, you're talking about a hierarchy of, of, uh, of construction again. You're saying something more complicated than the watch had to make the watch. Okay? You have to go beyond that and say, well, if you go all the way back up to God, then once again you're at the same impasse, logically, saying that, well, who created God then? <laughs> that, that brings us to an interesting uh, impasse, doesn't it? Because you know, we, we kind of really need uh, a little bit more to go on than uh, what uh, the believer is willing to give us. As a matter of fact, what what I like to do is kind of define what I mean by God, okay? Sometimes, and this is not very frequent, but sometimes a believer will say to me, well, you know, you, uh, you like money a lot, don't you? You know, you use money a lot. And I said, well, yeah, you know, this is the way our society works. You know, money is the, the basis of uh, our economic system instead of, say, barter or something. He says, well, money is probably your God then. You know, and I look at him, well, okay, did you're telling me then that dollar bills or something created the universe? You know, and he said, well, no, I don't mean that. And I said, well, that's what I mean by God. And so what I mean by God, whenever I use the term, is uh, the being who is beyond nature. Okay, so he's supernatural, and he created the universe. Uh, I use the term he, but it doesn't have to be a he, I guess. You know, it, whatever. And he has certain characteristics. This is where I think the believer gets into more trouble than he likes to admit. So the, the characteristics include uh, omnipotence, that is, all-powerfulness. I know where this one's going. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Omniscience, okay, all-knowingness. Uh, omnibenevolence, in the Christian version of God anyway, he's all-good. And... Uh, in the Catholic Encyclopedia, they add another little characteristic. Actually, they list like 23 characteristics of God, and one of them is incomprehensibility. Okay, <laughs> now wait a second. <laughs> so we can't even understand them, or we can't understand anything about them then, uh, from the word go. So we really can't intelligently. It talk seems like about a little them. back door there. Yeah, a outdoor, let's, you know. Yeah, let's. Someone's been thinking when they were writing this. That's right. Say, we got to leave an out here, <laughs> and and you'll see that that out is definitely needed. Because take a God that knows everything, okay? And Very yet, pinnacle of yeah. existence. Sure. He you know, um, is also all-powerful. He can do anything he wants. He knows everything and he can do anything. Now, my question to the believer is, does that God know what the future is going to be for certain? For absolute certain. And the, the answer is uh, usually, yes, of course. I, and I will say, well, then, he is powerless. He cannot change the future if he knows that's the way it's going to be absolutely and certainly. <laughs> so it kind of puts the believer into a bit of a bind. But can't then, be both omnipotent and omniscient. You just can't. And the believer immediately says, well, God knows the future, and it is the way he wants it to be. But that's a, what they call a red herring. That's beside the point. That doesn't matter whether it's what he wants or not. The question is, can he in principle change it? Can he change his mind? If he can, then he's not omniscient because he didn't know what the new thing was going to be, what the new future development was going to be. If he can't change his mind, then he's not all-powerful. What about, uh, what do you think about uh, the characteristics of being omnibenevolent or all-good and omnipotent? Or omnipotent. <laughs> well, if you're going to say that the, that the 
this thing that you're calling God, this generic God's yes. concept that we're talking against right now, uh, if you're going to give a being, first place, being, okay, that in very first thing uh, denotes something that is natural, something that exists, something, if you're talking about supernatural, and yet it influences this world, the moment that it influences the world, it has done something in the natural world, and in order to do that, it must be a natural force. Uh, if I cannot move this plant with my mind, although there are some <laughs> New Agers out there that would argue against me, and I don't even want to get into that, but uh, the point being that you can't, uh, you, it cannot be both supernatural and a being at the same time. Uh, a, a supernatural denotes outside the realm of, of so natural existence. Then. It's contradictory, and also the benevolent idea. If you take it, if you take the, and you must take the words of what they mean. You must take, uh, when someone says supernatural, I have to assume what they're saying. I have to go with what they're saying. I can't try to guess what they're meaning. I have to go with their words. It's very important that they choose the right words when they're, when they're explaining. How do you respond to someone who says, uh, well, there's no such thing as the supernatural? Uh, I've had that uh, thrown at me quite a bit, that, uh, especially by New Agers. Well, you know, they'll say, uh, well, yeah, I agree. You know, the, the supernatural is a bunch of hogwash. Of course, I can still astral project and uh, reincarnate and move things with my mind. If it's natural, it should be demonstrable. It should be, you should be able to uh, set up an experiment, to examine it, to, to examine it. And by the way, all the ESP experiments, I know there's been a lot in the media and stuff that said, you know, well, the Russians are doing this. Sure, they're examining it. We examine too to see if there is something. However, the tightly controlled experiments, people like James Randi have investigated. And Randi has had a $15,000 check waiting for, I believe it's 20 years for someone to prove him evidence of supernatural or non-natural, uh, someone who can do ESP, someone who can predict accurately the future. Uh, you know, I'm not talking about like, <laughs> you know, someone that looks at stock reports so and says there's going to be a crash in such and such a day, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about someone who's going to say, you know, that such and such an airplane will crash or something like that. The Antichrist is coming on this that. day or something. Yeah. Without okay. prior knowledge of an ESP experience, the famous, uh, the cards and such. And, and okay. he, no one has ever even come close to claiming that. Now you would think that a person like Yuri Geller would have uh, just jumped at the chance to get that. This guy is continuously bending keys and all that on, on and shows. And avoiding James Randi yeah. at every cost. <laughs> Do you remember the, uh, the instance where he ran into James Randi? And um, Randi said, okay. You can, uh, I think the, the trick that day was lifting uh, pages in a telephone book. And uh, Randy said, okay, just let me do one thing. And he sprinkled little pieces of styrofoam over it, over the telephone book. And Geller couldn't do it. You know, his psychic powers were shot that day or something, or non believer vibes had uh, turned him off. <laughs> but of course, you know, he pretty much showed that. Uh, yeah, well, what Geller was doing was blowing across the top of the pages, and that was making them come up. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of work that the debunkers have done, and unfortunately, we could go on for this for for hours, and it's gone on as long as man has. But yeah. we're we're out of time here, and that's the reality of of this show. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to encourage y'all, anybody out there who's interested in some more of these arguments, or if you have a new argument, boy, give it to us. We'd like to hear it. Um, our address will be on the screen. Uh, Free Thought Forum, 999 East Bassey Road, Suite 180, uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, or give us a call, uh, a phone number that uh, we can show on the screen. And uh, if you have some questions, ask them. We encourage free inquiry. That's what it's all about. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thank you for watching. I think as I please. And this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to duke or dictator. No person can deny Deacon Duncan's sinful.